Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren. I am your host. If you found this video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. Uh, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, please make sure to give us a follow on there, and especially on Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, the much the much promised here a uh, uh, little who was St. John of Damascus, as well as we're going to be going over one of his treatises on uh, the divine images on iconoclasm. Uh, St. John of Damascus was a Syrian uh, monk. He never lived under Byzantine rule, as we'll talk about here in a minute. He only he was born under the Umayyad Caliphate and only ever lived under Arab rule, which is interesting that he was a He's a Christian. He's, uh, some would say, the last uh, church father, certainly a doctor of the church, um, but never lived under uh, Christian rule himself. And so we are going to get into this right here. Uh, so a, a little bit first on who was St. John of Damascus. So he was born in 675 or 676. The dates are not exactly clear. Uh, he was born in Damascus under the Umayyad Caliphate, so he was born in modern Syria, the city of Damascus, still there in Syria, of course. And as, as I said, he never lived under Byzantine rule, even though he was be considered you know, a Greek uh, Catholic himself. And he died in 749 in, at the uh, Marsaba Monastery near Jerusalem, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit more here. Uh, as I said, he is a doctor of the church, and some consider him the last of the church fathers. Uh, and he is venerated as a saint in both the Catholic and Orthodox churches, I believe as well. He's recognized as a saint in the Anglican church, uh, but I'm not, exa- I'm not very familiar with uh, who the Anglicans consider saints or not. Uh, John's father uh, was named Sarjun Ibn Mansur, and he was an official in the uh, court of the Umayyads. Uh, this is a thing, as I've, I think I've mentioned before here on the show, is that when the Arabs uh, invade and uh, set up you know, their caliphate there in the, in the Middle East and take over a lot of Byzantine territory, you end up with a lot of old uh, Byzantine citizens, uh, Christians, administering these Arab states because uh, the Arabs themselves didn't have experience with uh, uh, ruling over a large, complex, organized uh, state like this. Not that they didn't have their own society, which they, which they ruled over, but it was more uh, nomadic. Um, it wasn't as far-reaching as this, and so they needed some help from the guys who were already there, the guys who were already doing it. And when you've got these guys around who, are, who already have experience doing this, who already know what they're doing, and they can keep the peace and kind of maintain some semblance of normalcy, you want to you wanna do that because the more normalcy you can maintain, the less likely people are to rebel. Uh, and uh, it, it is believed as well that uh, Heracli, uh, sorry, uh, St. John's uh, grandfather was a, an official in the court of Heraclius, Heraclius, the last emperor before uh, the Arabs invaded and, and uh, took over you know, half of the Byzantine Empire there, which we talked about a couple episodes ago. You can go listen to it. Uh, uh, Heraclius, I would say, you know, tra- tragic hero of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, John's father... St. John's father, insisted that he study Greek literature. So uh, there's a good chance I would say that he was bilingual. He certainly knew Greek because he would have spoken spoken Greek at home and learned Greek in his studies. But I think it, you, ha- I, yeah, I have to imagine uh, he would have known some Arabic because he's living in an Arab state. And so uh, I'm not saying he was he would have been totally fluent in Arab Arabic, but I would imagine that he could he spoke enough Arabic to go to the marketplace and you know order you know, whatever whatever it is you order. At the marketplace and just talk to people and do do basic basic business basic levels of communication. Uh, John was tutored by a monk named Cosmas, who uh, was actually captured from Sicily by the Arabs, and uh, this was this was arranged by John's father, and it, it allowed him access to the Western uh, Christian tradition because Cosmos was from Sicily, so he's from the West, and so he brings with him a lot of the Western Christian writings and traditions and. And all that sort of thing. So he almost certainly would have read like Augustine, uh, for example, translated into into Greek. And so uh, Saint John Damascus follows in his father's footsteps, and he also becomes an official in the uh, court of the Umayyad Caliphate. 
And uh, it seems that he may have also befriended the caliph uh, Yazid I. Uh, however, uh, John enters religious life around the time when the Umayyads transition from Greek to Arabic and as an, as an administrative language. So when John first enters the court, uh, uh, the language of the uh, caliphate's uh, governance, uh, the language of the court is, is Greek, the same Greek that is spoken in Constantinople. However, as time goes on, it transitions to Arabic uh, as, as you know, the Arab state becomes more and more established uh, they no longer need the, uh, the, the Greek-speaking Christians to um, help them administer things so they can they transition to Arabic. Now, I'm not saying that this is necessarily the reason why uh, St. John Damascus leaves the court and goes to live in a religious life. I'm, you know, he, I'm certain he would have had a religious calling to it. Um, we don't necessarily know if he spoke, you know, maybe he just spoke Arabic well enough to get around and talk to people at the marketplace, but maybe not well enough to to do administrative government, you know, that's more complex and technical language, which maybe he didn't have a grasp on. Uh, so it may, it may have helped push him out of it, but I, like I said, I'm certain that he had a religious calling to enter, to enter the monastic life, which is, which is what he, he was a monk. Um, and so John, St. John wrote harsh criticisms of the Koran as well as Islam generally, but we're not focusing on that today. Um, we are, today we're focusing on his criticism of iconoclasm. Now, iconoclasm came up in, uh, it's come up in the last couple of lectures here, but just as a reminder, iconoclasm is uh, simply, uh, clasm means like smashing or breaking, uh, and so iconoclasm means icon smashing or icon breaking. The idea here was that a couple of Byzantine emperors had got this idea in their head that the reason that they had failed against the Arabs and lost half of the empire, you know, the reason they lose Syria and Palestine and Egypt and North Africa um, is because they've lost God's favor because they are under the impression that uh, they're, they're not in God's favor because of the icons, which are very popular in the Byzantine Empire, uh, paintings of Jesus, Mary, and the saints. And they view that as graven images, which God warns against in the Bible. And so they say, well, the, the thing we need to do to uh, get back in God's favor is to destroy the icons uh, uh, and not make any more of them. Well, uh, John, St. John Damascus here is, he actually writes several treatises on, uh, uh, in favor of the icons. He's an iconophile, not an iconoclast. Uh, and so we're going to be reading, the, the, uh, the book I'm using here is from the popular patristic series. It is Three Treatises on the Divine Image, or sorry, Divine Images by St. John of Damascus. This is published by uh, St. Vladimir's Seminary Press in Crestwood, New York. Uh, it is translated by Andrew Louth, who is a former professor of Byzantine Studies and Patristics. Uh, he worked at Durham University as well as Oxford. I believe he's retired now. Uh, I think he's also an Eastern, right? I think he's an Eastern Catholic priest or, Byzantine, or, uh, or an Orthodox priest. I'm not sure. But if you, if you look up pictures of the guy, he's in, he's in priest clothes. And of, of the three treatises, like, uh, uh, we're only going to be examining the first one. It's, this is a very short book. Uh, th this version of the book I have, it's not even 200 pages with, between the three uh, treatises. Yeah, it's uh, 158 pages. So... If you want to pick this up, I'm sure it's cheap on Amazon, all these books. The benefit of being a history major in college, especially focusing on uh, ancient and medieval history, was that your books were always really cheap. I never I never spent more than like $200, $200 on books in a semester, whereas my, fr my friends who uh, who are like science majors, like biology majors, oh my gosh, they spent like $500, $700 a semester on books. It's crazy. But anyway, I think it's first uh, useful for us to define the term veneration because we're talking about the veneration of icons. And again, veneration does not mean the same as worship. And so I think it's useful to define the word here. And uh, St. John gives a def his uh, definition of the word veneration. I'll give a little etymology as well. So this is on page 27 of my, of my copy here. Uh, so veneration, uh, this is John here. Veneration, bowing down, is a symbol of submission and honor. And we know the different forms of this. The first is a form of worship, which we offer to God, alone by nature, of worthy, by nature worthy of veneration. Then there is the veneration offered on account of God, who is naturally venerated, to his friends and servants, 
as Jesus, son of Nave and Daniel, venerated the angel. Now, when it says Jesus here, he's uh, actually referring to Joshua from the Old Testament because uh, Jesus, the, 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 the name that we get of uh, Jesus from the New Testament, um, is actually in Hebrew that would have been Yeshua. And Yeshua, uh, Jesus is just a, uh, the, the Greek version of Yeshua. Or Joshua, right? Uh, and so, and then if you if you look up the etymology of the word venerate, it comes from the Latin venerari, which means to adore or to revere. All right, we're going to turn the page twenty-two here. And in, in this part of the treatise, uh, St. John states that those who support iconoclasm do not understand the scripture. He says that they only understand the letter, the, the surface of what the, the, the text of the scripture is saying, but they don't understand the spirit or the, you know, uh, they're, not, they're not delving deeper into the deeper meaning of the, of the text of, of scripture. And they often point out how uh, people like Moses said you should venerate uh, God and God alone, or how Abraham is said to have smashed uh, pagan idols very early on. Uh, the, this is not actually in the Bible. It's, I think it's in a Talmudic text. Uh, but anyway, St. John says here, and again, this is on page 22 of my copy. He says, Brothers, those who do not know the scripture truly err, for as they do not know that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, they do not interpret the, the spirit hidden beneath the letter. So what he's saying here is they're just, they're just reading the surface of the text. They're not, reading, they're not reading deeper into the text. They're not getting the deeper meaning of the text. Uh, this, uh, I believe, uh, in, in the circles of uh, uh, scriptural interpretation, this is called exegesis. And then... Uh, on the next page here, on page 23, he says that uh, the commandment about uh, not worshiping graven images was given because people were worshiping idols of pagan gods. There's no issue of people making idol making idols uh, to the one true God. There's no issues of people uh, uh, venerating uh, idols to people making idols to God. That's that's not something that happens, and that's not what the commandments are for. Right? If you if you look at the ex uh, examples of this in the Old Testament, right? I always when I when I've taught uh, theology, I always t and I and I teach Old Testament. I always tell kids that. You know, people in the Old Testament did a lot of bad things. God forgives a lot of things in the Old Testament. You know, Cain kills his brother Abel. David uh, impregnates Bathsheba when he's not married to her. Uh, Jacob steals his brother's inheritance. Right? These are all these are all less than desirable things for people to do, to say the least. Uh, but God forgives all of them. But there's one big no-no in the Old Testament that is very offensive to God, and that is is not you know forgiven. Really tarnishes your your reputation. I mean, it, it would be forgiven if people you know, came back and really repented. But it's it's the big. I always tell kids it's the big no-no, and that's idol worshiping. But the thing about it is, it's always people worshiping idols of something that is not God, right? The, the Hebrews uh, in the desert, when Moses, up, Moses is up on the mountain, they make an idol of the golden calf. Uh, Solomon, for example, starts worshiping uh, pagan idols, I believe, of Baal, um, uh, because, you know, he's, hanging, he, he's married to all these uh, uh, pagan women, uh, and, you know, he's hanging around with them, and they're, they're influencing him to, to make altars to pagan gods and, instead of uh, the one true God, right? And so that's what he gets in trouble for there. And so St. John says here, that, again, this is on page 23 of my copy of the text. You see how it was account, on account of idolatry that he prohibited the fashioning of images and that it is possible to depict God, or sorry, that it, that it is impossible to depict God who is incomprehensible and uncircumscribable and invisible. For it says, you have not seen his form, but also Paul, standing in the midst of Areopagus, said, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine is like gold or silver or stone, a representation of human art and imagination. So he's saying there, it's not on the account, it's on the account of idolatry. That, pe that God gives these commandments. And so there's no, there's no direct commandment about making, not making idols or not making icons to uh, God the Father, God the Son, 
God the Spirit, Mary, etc. Uh, he continues here on the next page, this is on page 24. It was therefore for the Jews, on account of their sliding into idolatry, that these things were ordained by law. Now we have here on page 27 and 28, I've already read a little bit of of this, but I'll read it again. Uh, John says, there are instances in scripture where the faithful are directed by God to venerate certain things, such as the Ark of the Covenant, which is covered by the cherubs, or Joshua, who venerates the angel uh, who he encounters. So I'll just, I already read this, but I'll, I'll just go over it again. So John says here, this is St. John says here, this is on page 27, uh, there is the veneration offered on account of God who is naturally venerated to his friends and servants as Jesus, the son of Nave and Daniel, venerated the angel or to the places of God, such as David said, let us venerate this place where he, where his feet stood or the sacred things to him as Israel venerated the, tab- the tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem, standing in a circle around it, and then from everywhere bowing in veneration towards it. Uh, right, so if, you, if you've ever seen a, an artistic interpretation or people have recreated the uh, Ark of the Covenant, uh, it's got two uh, cherubs on it, two, two angels, which sit on top of it, and that's supposed to be like protection, I think. Uh, but, right, the people of Israel were instructed to venerate the tabernacle, the, the uh, well, sort of a tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant, um, which, ha- which has cherubs on top of it, which are images made by human hands. Uh, but it's, not, it, it's, it's done in worship of God. It's not done in worship of pagan gods. It's done in worship of the one true God. And then the last bit of the text here that we are going to read, this is from page 24. And John says here, you know, there are those who oppose icons who ask, how can you depict the divine form when you have not seen it? And as he says, God is incomprehensible and sort of describable. You, know, you can't depict God in artwork because you know it's limiting and God is unlimited. So how can you limit something that's unlimited? You, it's, it's, you can't. You can't do it. Um, however, the easy answer to this is that Christ, who is the divine, who is divine, who is the second person of the of the Trinity, took human form uh, to to be among us, and many people witness his works. You know, the, the, the gospel tells us there's hundreds of eyewitnesses to the crucifixion, for example. Um, and so, because of this, we do have a way that we can that we can depict the divine in artwork. And this is a long quote that I've picked out here before, but I'm probably going to cut down on it just a little bit. Uh, So St. John says here, uh, quoting scripture, for it says, you have not seen his form, what wisdom the legislature has, how could the invisible be depicted, how could the unimaginable be portrayed, how could one without measure or size or limit be drawn, how could the formless be made, how could the bodilessness be depicted in color. What therefore is that? Uh, what therefore is this that is received in riddles? For it is clear that when you see the boldness become human for your sake, then you may accomplish it, accomplish the figure of the human form. And so, basically, what he's saying here, uh, if I skip down a little bit. Uh, by transcending his own nature, his bodilessness, formlessness, incommensurable, incommensurable without magnitude or size, that is, the uh, one who is in the form of God, taken, taking the form of a slave, by this reduction to quantity and magnitude, puts on the characteristics of a body, then depicts him on a board or and set up to view the one who has accepted to be seen. Okay, so he I, it's almost he's almost mocking here, <laughs> you know, in the beginning. He's like, uh, how could the invisible be depicted? How could the unimaginable be portrayed? And he's like, well, you know, uh, we did have the we did have like the divine come down and become human flesh and walk among us and live among us and crucified, died, and was buried, and all that. And so what he's saying here is because you know because. Uh, 
because Jesus is the is divine, he's the second person of the Trinity, and he took human form, and because a lot of people saw him, we can make artistic uh, representations of him, and uh, and and it's and it's fitting to worship them, as he also says it is fitting to worship the friends of of God. They're up there in heaven, the angels, and especially Mary and the saints, because you know, we know they're all up there in heaven. Uh, uh, that is venerating Mary and the saints and worshiping God, right? And that's how that's how Catholics set it up, despite what some Protestants may say. But it's a very cursory, uh, a very basic uh, uh, kind of primer here for uh, Saint John of Damascus. He obviously has a lot more writings. He has a lot more to say. We've only gone over one treaty here, or treatise here. He he has three on the divine images. So if you're curious, again, getting this book, it's from the popular patristic series, Three Treatises on the Divine Images by St. John of Damascus, and translated by Andrew, let me make sure I'm getting the last name right here, Andrew Loth, L-O-U-T-H. If you're curious, I'm sure it's not that expensive on Amazon. Uh, Yeah, I'm not not saying you guys have to read the books, but I'm just saying if you're curious about what I'm using and you want to read it too, go for it. Uh, But that's all the time I have for you today. Again, if you've gotten this far in the video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. And then if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, please uh, give us a follow, and especially on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star review. So that's all I've got for you guys today, and I'll see you all next time.